explosion of wealth. How do you manage that? That's the key. Episode 130. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I'm speaking to Herman Morgan, who is the founder of MAD, which is a great name for a architecture practice, which he has based on his initials. And Herman actually began his architectural studies at South Bank in London, completing at Metropolitan University in 2006. He's worked for some great practices. He's worked at Ajay Associates. Um, he's worked for Arup, HOK, Grimshaw. He's done work on the 2012 Olympic Legacy venue um, and master planning for the London Euston HS2. And he co founded design studio MAD following a lot of research and his own expertise into tropical architecture and design which led to a series of collaborations and commissions in the Caribbean and also in the UK and particularly in Trinidad and Tobago and the way that the business model has evolved is really interesting and is now involved in a number of sort of development led projects um, over in the Caribbean so in this interview Herman discusses those projects, how they came into being, how he's utilised you know, intimate expertise and local knowledge of those areas and how he's beginning to develop and evolve his practice. So sit back, relax and enjoy Herman Morgan. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work. But it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next? What what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15 minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Herman, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for you, inviting me. My pleasure. You are the founder, co-founder, Director of MAD Architecture and Design. That's right. You yes, guys have got. You've had a quite a um, accomplished career to date. You've worked for Populous, Arab, Ajo Associates, um, to name a few. You've been involved in an array of master planning projects, and I'm really interested by the positioning and the the things that you're doing, kind of progressively with MAD and the yeah. sort of different types of projects that you're getting involved with, which kind of re, what's the word, re-define um, what the role of the architect is. Mm. And we were just talking now uh, about Carnival mm. in Trinidad. <laughs> and also your heritage is, is from Trinidad. So yes, I yes. think that's a nice way to start, to start framing this conversation is, is yeah. what's Carnival got to do with the way that you practicing architecture and, and the structure of your business? Well, it, first first thing, um, I grew up, yeah, a large part of my childhood was in Trinidad. Uh, so growing up, that was a huge, huge part of my life. Um, because especially where we lived, we was like a stone's throw from the melee uh, of Carnival. And you saw, I mean, back then it was such a, uh, 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 an interesting sort of uh, amalgamation of people from different countries just descending onto such a small island mm. and it was fantastic people coming together the costumes I mean I, I, I took part in numerous occasions um, and that has pretty much just been embedded in me since then and 
I guess it's that the uh, this the celebration is celebration of life, isn't it? And that that that's what I love about it. And I guess how 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 it relates to to my practice, I've always been drawn pretty much back to Trinidad for that reason. I mean, not obviously not just carnival, got family there and everything, but yeah. it's it's the global appeal of carnival now. Um, everybody can see it. it. It's it's about celebrating life enjoying yourself but it also has a, it does have political edge to it that yes. people don't really it's, it's not it's not as much it's not as politicized as it was mm. but back then it was a chance to you know criticize government uh, institutions all kinds but within the safety of you know having fun but you know mind yourself <laughs> you know you, you, you know yeah, but mainly overriding the overriding thing is, is it's, it was quite enjoyable. But yeah, I, I feel like the, 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 how it's influenced our practice is is is, is about celebrating life. Mm. That's that's a big part of it. Big part of it. So our, our, we like to do fun stuff. You know, enjoy ourselves in practice. We go out there as much many times a year, and now we're involved in um, tourism. A lot of well, I won't say tourism, but well, yeah, tourism. And hospitality projects out there because we feel like that's that's it's such an interesting way of it's almost like projects the culture how do you project the culture and that's where we're at so tell me a little bit about your practice at mad how how you got set up mm. and what's moved you into why you, you know you've gone into a number of development projects and you're focusing a lot on work and doing these kind of development projects in Trinidad yeah and you've got this nice relationship working both here in London yeah. and overseas. Mm. How did that come about? What what inspired you to start practicing like that? I mean it's it's been quite a long journey. Mm. Um, I wouldn't say I, I wouldn't say that it, it's something that we we thought okay we're definitely going to be working in from London and working in Trinidad. We we sort of we had an interest of doing work in the Caribbean. And the closest place I know is Trinidad, and obviously, like we will we'll explain, the, the the culture of the island is just like no other. So, instantly drawn there. But we we, I started. I wanted to look at. Um, I wanted to find out what, the, in terms of the birthplace of the culture, birthplace of of and that is actually what lives there, the birthplace of carnival culture. Mm-hmm. It doesn't just come from about just celebrating and you know jumping up in the air. It's to do with. Slavery is to do with emancipation. Is to do with um, celebration, and it, that the way that's evolved over time. And what we wanted to do is go back to the heart and see what, how we could, how we could just actually plug in mm. and and see what we could do. And we we set up a few meetings. Um, we actually went through the. Um, the British Embassy to set up quite a few meetings there. When we we met a really fantastic, uh, it was one of our first projects. There, we met a really fantastic um, uh, director of community or well, development in East Port of Spain. And just to give you a really really quick um, idea about East Port of Spain. So Port of Spain is the capital of Trinidad. East Port of Spain is where the steel pan instrument was created. Yeah. Very impoverished area, you know. It's not. It's not the most enterprising. Well, I wouldn't say not, not the most enterprising. It's not. It's not. In terms of the economy, it, it, it's it, it's a very poor area. Let's say that. Mm-hmm. And it's got. It's got. You know. Unfortunately, it's got a lot of crime. Um, but it, it. The cultural richness is there. Yeah. Absolutely. And to think that from that small place, it's. Shot around the world. Yeah, New York's got the carnival. Uh, London's got the carnival. You know, that's the birthplace of it. Yeah, and we were thinking how. Well, how I'd love to do. We'd love to do a project that actually you know helps the community out there because it's. I, I, I felt like well, this need the you know. How can we uplift the community there? Because it's got such press for me. It's got a lot of prestige. Mm. And we we were working with a, a community development out there um, named Deborah Thomas, and she want she. She actually used to work here. Um, she worked on the Canary Wharf uh, development as a project manager, mm. and it, we just got on straight away. 
And um, we t she, she toured us around East Port of Spain and it's not easy to be, I couldn't basically go there and walk around. It's, uh, it's quite dangerous in some parts. You, you know, if you don't live there, you, you, you know, you could get into trouble. So we went, we were escorted around to see the, see the location, see what, uh, see what they were doing. Mm. And that, that was the great thing. So we, we saw where one of the, like one of the, um, the guy who actually invented the steel pan, where he lived. Um, the, there's a, a few, we call them pan yards, where the actually drums are actually made. Um, there's like about 20 in the island, different, different groups. So we went there and we saw, and, and after that we, we thought, okay, we got, we got a really nice understanding, saw the community, great. And then um, we had another few meetings with another, a few, few uh, other, other groups. And then we, we came back we thought, well, it's great, great for our research, great to understand what the, what the, what the uh, area is about. But then about a month later, we got a call back from Deborah Thomas. Um, and she asked us, look, would you like to do a, 27 hectare master plan to regenerate the area. <laughs> we were like, uh, yes, please. Yeah, I'd love to do that. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me have a think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we kind of, you know, obviously playing it cool and everything. It's like, yeah, yeah, well, well you know, what was the criteria? I mean, what's the scope? Uh, all this sort of stuff. And, um, you know, got off the phone and we were just, we were jumping for joy. We were like, yeah, this is, this is a perfect opportunity to show what, not more what we can do and also how, you know, get our thinking hats on as to how to not only give back, but how to, how to come up with something different there. Yeah. Without it looking like it's just somewhere from, you know, it's just been plonked there from elsewhere. And yeah. so, and so what has that led into in terms of uh, a project? Was that the first of a number of these? That, that was one, we had a few small projects in the UK first. Yeah. After, after I left uh, practice work. So and then after that we decided to just take the leap and go over there, go over to Trinidad for a month where we did all this research. Right. So in a month we came back and then we, we had this. So then after that we uh, we did a, almost like a, a large as you as you can understand the project of that scale, uh, integrating new housing, sporting facility, cultural facility, cultural um, center, um, yeah. and a, a, a transport. Um, hub, right. It's a lot of work, so we spent quite a long time developing the concept for them to present to the stakeholders. And what was your role? Was it more the traditional master planner, urban designer role, or what, or did you have stake in final equity development or anything like that? Not at all. That we we were uh, basically the architects right. that were brought in to just go to town, just to see what you can do. Master planning. Building design, um, basically the feasibility study. Right. So we did we we did it all the way and, and sort of did a rough cost cost on it as well. So that gave us a good insight as to <laughs> doing a large project. Uh, it was it, it was quite intense. Yep. Uh, because the the, the the program was quite tight, but it was it was great because we I think it was our first foray into understanding how to look at the, the local culture and develop a type of architecture that is that is different from 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 a lot of other 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 types on the island. And did yeah. did this project give you a, a good entry point into working in Trinidad? Absolutely. Um, and kind of what sorts of things did you uncover and what sorts of obstacles have you encountered working in the Caribbean mm. and like how does it differ from working in the UK? Um, I, I would definitely say that uh, sometimes... And what are the opportunities? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean the, 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 it, it, in terms of speed of process... Sorry. Working, working with government can be, I mean, even here, can be quite a slow process. And it is out there. Um, a lot of, you know, decisions need to go up and up the chain of command, I guess. And then down the chain, and then you know you yes. go on to the next stage. So it's a little bit slower out there, but you know it, it is actually not not. I wouldn't say it's not it's not that much different from here to be right. honest. It, it, Trinidad is quite a. It, it for I know people think uh, sometimes think that uh, 
the Caribbean, Trinidad is kind of quite slow paced. Trinidad is not slow paced. Trinidad is quite fast paced. It's industrial. Uh, it's business hub. It's obviously you know, it's not natural gas, oils, all this uh, sort of uh, other sectors are quite highly developed and skilled. So mm. it's not a slow process. You can get decisions quickly. People want to do things very quickly. People travel a lot. Um, the same Deborah, uh, Deborah Thomas, she was actually, in, when we got there, she's like, oh yeah, I was just in the UK like uh, about two months ago. So it's, people travel a lot. So it's not it's not a, a slow paced country, I would think. To, yeah. Relative, obviously relative to the States and here, yes, it's, of course, of course it's, it's just, there's no comparison, but you still have to keep on your toes. Yeah. And there's still a lot that, that, that gets done out there. Um, so yeah. And, and what's been your role in terms of being involved in development? So you, you have the, the arm Cove Bay. Mm. Tell us a little bit about what Cove Bay is. Well, Co- Cove Bay is, uh, it's it actually came about from a, a project that we were doing in Englishman's Bay in Tobago. We did a feasibility where we were, we were, this is one of our first forays into actually engaging in doing development work as, you know, with architectural practice. Yeah. Um, and we approached uh, a, a, a uh, landowner and did some work on their, you know, did some uh, 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 scheme on their property. Um, and we, we, you know, it got to a certain stage and we, we thought, okay, well, is this a bit more than we can chew? Uh, the landowner was like, yeah, okay, well, maybe we can do something, but then the, I think the cost it was, was a bit of an issue at the time. And in terms of the economy, the economy, the tourism economy, at that point, it, I don't think for that scale of project, it, it, it may not have been ready. It's like a 400 hectare, uh, sorry, 400 acre site that we had. Right. And that was also a lot of work. But then we, we, we decided, okay, maybe we need something slightly smaller, more manageable. Um, and we, we were basically looking for different sites to develop ourselves. So when I say that, we were looking for like-minded landowners, like-minded um, professionals also that can come in with us mm. and help develop a scheme and us all obviously benefit from that, you know, work-wise, equity, stake, um, investment, etc. cetera. Um, so, because we're also looking into trying to I guess, I mean, the tourism economy there is, is still, it's an emerging market yes. for tourism. Yeah. So we're looking at different ways to try and push that um, using our, our background and knowledge of the, of the, of the country. So we're, you know, we, we, we've managed to get you know, our foothold in a really, really good site um, in Tobago. And then we're running with it. There's another project we're doing where we, we're, we're working with... Um, uh, well, we, we've, we've conceived this project, but we're also working with the t- tourism agencies out there, mm-hmm. and local government agencies, to almost strategically develop certain parts of the island, not on a massive scale, just creating really good projects, which feeds well into you know good architectural quality, uh, um, good architectural, a good architectural project. To integrate onto different sites that are of interest to that have really, really good. Tobago's got such a beautiful, beautiful scenery. Yes. Very much untouched, um, and it, but it's underdeveloped in terms of tourism, which is interesting as well. So, like I say, it's these areas that aren't really developed. It's like fertile ground. What can we do? Yeah. So it's exactly the same approach we use in Trinidad when we're uh, the larger project. So we're looking into how do we, you know, protect the environment, not overdevelop, budget, but create something groundbreaking and interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think that's needed because we, you're competing with different uh, islands that have got 30 years on you in terms of types of project and the type of hospitality projects anyway. Barbados, everybody knows Barbados, Jamaica. It's, it's the, the scale, I'll give you an idea of the scale, uh, Jamaica, in terms of uh, the hotel accommodation, they have like about 30,000 rooms. Tobago has about five. In, to, in total? In total. In the whole island? Yeah. Tobago has about 5,000. So 30,000, so they've, that's because their tourism economy, their, their, their economy is generally dependent on tourism, so it's, it's, it's actually has helped them, but um, we have a lot to catch up. Yeah. But we don't. They, they, we don't want to be 
you don't want to have I guess thirty thousand rooms. And, and and what what's the the architectural climate like then in in both Trinidad and Tobago, and and what sorts of competition do you come up against mm. if there is if there is any, or are you, are you working much more collaboratively with local architects or? Um, I wouldn't say, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not saying that there's, 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 there's good work out there, but um, a lot of the ideas tend to be imported, right, from the US, from the US, that. Europe, um, local architects, yeah, is taking ideas from these places, and um, what I feel like the journey that we've had is gotten us to a point where we can actually explore something completely different, mm. and because I lived out there. It also gives us a little bit, I feel like, a, a maybe a slight edge, hopefully, because we, we, I understand how to interpret the culture from growing up in small old houses, but really beautifully detailed. The kind of old wooden colonial old, houses. Old wooden colonial houses, but then some really old, um, almost not, not, I wouldn't say colonial style, but um, it's semi-indigenous stuff, because there's a lot of indigenous architecture out there that, have, that was appropriated by... Um, slaves and indentured workers right. that have actually developed into other typologies, not colonial. Right. So we've looked at that oh, that's interesting. and said, how can we look at this? And we, we, got, we researched that like over the last two years mm. and find it. I'll tell you where there's great examples of that. Trinidad and Tobago, yep. Haiti. Haiti's got, it's got a lot more than Trinidad. It's got really? so many different housing types there. That have been made locally made. Some of them are obviously from obviously French colonial sort of uh, influences. Yeah. But there are hundreds, hundreds of typologies. So we've been researching um, them, floor plans, etc. And we've just tried to sort of reconfigure, re reinterpret those types into new types of buildings, new ways of circulating um, uh, um, or joining spaces, mm. new types of program. The way people cook, sleep, eat, move there is totally different, and that needs to be explored. Um, that that's why I feel you know sometimes I, I think when 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 influences are imposed, it it it, it can work for a time, but then you, you you know you have to you have to work with the with the culture. It's almost like I always compare it with you know you've got Japan Japanese architecture. Everybody knows what it is. Um, British architecture, you know what it is, to a degree. Spanish. When it comes to the Caribbean, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, well, it was just shacks and huts and stuff. But it's not. It's you, when you look, you have, but you have to dig. Yeah. And I, I, like I said, I've got the, the 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 I've been lucky enough to live there and live in some of those. So I've got an understanding of how the spaces work. Like, why was this? You know, why have you, there's a house with like three rooms? Why is there just three rooms in the house? There's no corridors. There's no but when you look at the ventilation strategy, it's like, oh, it's actually, that actually works. So the people were thinking about this all this time. And we use that. Materials from you know, literally cut from the forest as boarding that I quite liked because it's got a rough roughness to it, but it, it, it actually functions well. And it's just, yeah, it, it's just those kind of things that really interest me because it, it, it sparks newness. Yeah. And uh, it, you, you're starting to reinvent things, uh, re reinvent types um, so, so from yeah. um, your sort of role as mm. within the business mm. when you're on some a lot of these projects what is your role now is it more of architect or is it more of developer and ha what what's the difference between the two or are you an architect with with equity uh, at stake in these projects or? I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say it's it, it's an equal share because I I, I, I enjoy I enjoy being an architect, yeah, I don't think that could ever leave me. Yeah. But the practicalities of delivering what we would like to deliver and what we're delivering, you have to have a developer's hat on. Yes, and you have to have an understanding of how that how that role functions. Um, we don't know it all by any stretch of the imagination. We've we've had, like I said, we have to bring a consultant on board that understands that a little bit more. So we're learning about that. Right. That, okay. That's part as well. But um, I, I like, I, at the moment, I like dividing that sort of, the two, having the two hats equally divided. Mm. Some days, <laughs> you know, you're more sort of like 70, 30 developer. And then some days you're like, look, okay, well, why, why are we creating a project looking like this? 
why what's the material why are we applying that material what's the narrative behind the project mm. is it strong enough is the concept strong enough go back rethink so there's those two tussles there's a constant tussle to be honest yeah all the time. well it sounds like it's actually quite a nice tussle in a way because mm. you do get to go into a having an understanding of what's important as a developer and making the numbers mm. stack up and actually having the long the, the financial life cycle of the building yeah, yeah. working and you know and but inside of that or underpinning that is mm. the commitment to architectural design yeah and also the uh, what you're saying about this celebration of mm. Trinidadian and, and you know the, and the, the island's culture yeah. Uh, yeah and kind of having that expressed in the architecture is actually these are difficult things to quantify in terms of their yes. value but they are the most valuable thing yes Yes. in many ways and so being able to as an architect we can mm. kind of we can always dip back into that and ensure yes. that that's, that's present in the projects yeah because you'd spend weeks I mean I you know spent the last couple of weeks pouring over figures yeah no design work whatsoever mm. just pouring over figures and checking and um, meetings and it's you know sometimes it's good to have that break you just you're just focusing on you know how is this actually going to work financially who wants what? How are we? How can we benefit uh, from that and to bring to the next project? And but uh, the oh, I think the overarching um, the overarching sort of direction is we 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 I think we're trying to create a series of examples. Mm -hmm. You know, this what this is what can be done. Yeah, out there. This is this is what a life. You know, types of lifestyle. That exists, that can exist out there, that aren't, you know, that don't just have, uh, there's not just a one size fits all. It's, there's so many different spectrums of, of, of ways of developing out there with an architect's hat on. <laughs> so, how, how do you structure your team then to be able to be based here and also yeah. be working out there without spending thousands and thousands of pounds commuting yeah. back and forth? For well, we, we, we have, um, so we have a core team of there's, there's three of us there's me uh, my wife and uh, another partner who's in Barbados who tackles some of the local um, I guess any meetings and things that we have to go to right out there he tends to tackle that right um, good friend of mine Ian, his name's Ian Ramsey and we actually studied here we actually <laughs> remember the um, the project I was telling you about the, the Olympics he was actually he was in the same unit as I, I was right. but he was a year above me actually so um, he left, um, worked here for a while, and then went to Barbados. So then we've 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 always been tight, actually. Uh, actually, you know, we went to South Bank together. Sorry, missed that bit. We went to we did part one together. Right. Okay. So we've known each other for so long, and he's probably the most generous and really down to earth guy that you could ever meet. And I always thought, even back then, we we should work together. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And it's Bayesian accent. We we'll work together one day, one day. And now we are. So. And yeah, he's been he's been great because he 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 used to work um, and he does touch on, on that as well. Work for a hotel developer, so they you know he's, it's given him the background as well that plugs in to so any tricks that we're missing, he more you've got that expertise the, of, yeah. of tourism and hospitality exactly. Kind of, kind of he knows through. exactly you know how quick what type of uh, apartments go quickly when on sale yeah. Down to you know what type of uh, you know um, lining is needed for the bathrooms in the hotel that are five star. It's just like priceless now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> out there. So uh, because there's all sort of the, the climate is different uh, to here, so you got to have that this type of consideration. So so he's been a godsend. So and, and my wife, um, she's uh, well, two of us are based here. So my wife are based here, and I based here, and Ian is in the Caribbean. And then we, what we use, we, we have, um, we usually just have contractors working for us now and again to do odd bits of work for us. So you keep it fairly lightweight in terms of... Very, very lightweight. Um, we tend to work quite agile, in an agile way now, because that, that's, that's the way of the world now, yeah. cloud-based um, servers. So it's, which is, that's really helped us a lot. Well, I, I find it really exciting speaking with architects like yourself who are 
taking on the role of developer who are getting engaged with joint venture partnerships, who are engaging with finding, sourcing, fi uh, finance for projects, still retaining a kind of um, design hat as well, um, and sort of making sure that that imperative is still there in projects. And also doing it, venturing into different economies mm. where perhaps there are new opportunities that are not so accessible that you would get to do in the UK. I mean, it's very unlikely. It's, yeah. very, it's difficult to do any kind of large resident um, hospitality hotel resort in in London. Yeah. You know, that it, it, it's kind of... Yeah. Know, and, yeah, so, yeah. and so broaching these opportunities, and obviously there's a lot of risk as well. In, yes. In many ways, like you're going into a, a, a country where you haven't lived for a, a long period of time. Yeah. It yeah. operates... Well, tell me, what, what, what are the ways that it operates differently to the UK, um, if any? Or I think it's it... a lot more, to be honest, it's a lot more free. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 what I did was I actually, without letting the cat out of the bag, I actually went to the British Embassy, because I, I, I'm not this kind of person that tends to be like, oh, what, what are we going to do? How are we going to do, you know, you know, yes, there's strategy, but I tend to just go straight to the source. So I yeah. went, okay. <clears throat> I'd like to get meetings with this person, this person, this person, because I think maybe they're the decision makers and maybe this is where, where we can actually have, uh, no, number one, especially in the early days, you know, get some work. Number two, just find out how things work. Because who, you know, who, who were the key figures that you um, went and Well, the basically the British Embassy. Right. We just went to the British Embassy. We, we were in touch with them by email, calling, uh, because it's like there's a lot of Trinidadians that work in the British Embassy right. that facilitate uh, investment and service providers from overseas. Got it. So we went straight to them and I said, look, I'm, I'm a local, sort of, <laughs> <laughs> from London, born in Birmingham. <laughs> a local, yeah. Um, and the, and we, we're architects and we are looking to, you know, uh, looking to see what we can do uh, in, in Trinidad. Mm. That was it. And we said we'd like to meet this person, this person, this person, because we've got great ideas and we feel like we can contribute uh, and do some good work. That was it. And we just got the meetings. I think if... Amazing. Yeah, yeah. We, we, but we, we, we just went in there. Yeah. No, we, we didn't, I didn't dither around and, and stuff. So, yeah, that's, and I think that's sometimes just how you have to be, you know, to get some things done and get, just move on. You have to just go straight in and... Yeah, plunge. facilitate those relationships. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It doesn't just drop from the sky. It it is a very interesting region. I mean, as I've yeah. said to you before, my family is from Guyana mm. originally. My mum is from Guyana, so I know Georgetown. Yeah, relatively well. I've yet to go. I've yet to go. I've still. I've definitely it's, got to go. It's it's. A, I mean, I love it. It's one of these kind of amazing places. And again, it's a very interesting architectural mm. heritage of you know those kind of old. Wooden colonial houses, very ornate. Yeah, kind of yeah. strange Victorian ground plan uh, floor plans, but yeah. in a sort of tropical environment. Mm -hmm. um, and the region obviously is going through an economic upheaval and shift, mm -hmm. obviously with the with the discovery of oil and yes. what's yes. going to be happening there. Yes, how is that kind of affecting uh, Trinidad's economy? And will it open up new relationships and new opportunities? And um, uh, well, as far as as far as I understand, there's there's already a, a collaboration, a collaboration, um, especially with the. And I'm I'm not I'm not an expert on this, but in terms of the the, the energy um, management, I think there's a collaboration already there because Trinidad is almost already be like forty fifty years deep in petroleum and uh, natural gas industry yeah so it knows how to how to process this, process that type of uh, those materials etc to make obviously to uh, boost the economy contribute to the economy and then it spreads to other sectors obviously that find that, that sort of uh, financial sort of gain from that so I think there's already a relationship there that they've, they've, they've started looking at um, but I think for in terms of their relationship, um, I think it can only get stronger because it's, it's almost like, you know, I think it's great for the country. Mm. It's great for, 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 for Guyana. Um, I mean, I know it's, it's, got, it's a actually a huge landmass and it's got quite a small uh, capital. Yes. 
But I can, you know, there, there's there probably going to be, you know, external um, influences that are looking to develop it now because there's, you know, there's this suddenly, you know, um, explosion of wealth. How do you manage that? Yeah. That's, uh, that's the key. I yeah. think that's the key. With Trinidad, it, it, there's, you know, there's been uh, quite a lot of um, challenges with that. I think with every economy, there's challenges, there's explosions of wealth. Yeah. Um, with Trinidad, it was, there was a really, I think, round about this similar, similar time, you have the push for independence, got the oil sort of funds coming through. Yeah. That actually, the timing was great. So it had a real big uplift as nationalism, identity, etc. cetera, the way, you know, how we see ourselves. And so, that, and so you transpose that to Guyana now. Mm. It's, it's going to fuel, you know, confidence. It's going to fuel a lot of drive, development, all sorts of stuff. And I would love to get, that's what I'm saying, I'd love to visit because I'd love to see, you know, it, the development opportunities, culture. There's so much scope. Yeah. Uh, yeah um, it'd be great, to, great to go. Maybe we could go what, together. What? <laughs> yeah, let's do a little, let's do a little recce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what would be your advice be to architects looking to do development in countries that are mm. outside of the UK? And, and do you think it's a prerequisite for to have some sort of relationship with that country beforehand or do you think it's possible to to jump in and start exploring opportunities having no relationship to uh, I th- I a think, place? I think you have to do your research. Yeah. You have to do your research. Like I said, part of my research was actually growing up there. So yeah. it's already there. <laughs> so I, I, I already sort of... Uh, or you know, you know the culture. You know how what people are like. They, how you know how to sort of navigate just the way people talk and what they mean. Um, if you're going to go to, a, if you're going to venture to a different, um, a, 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 God, sorry, not different territory. A different. If you're going to venture into a different, um, a different location, I think it's a good idea. You've got to do your research. Number one, got to do your research. Try and get somebody on the ground that already knows the environment to yeah. sort of partially buddy up with. Yeah. Um, and and go through the channels that you know will help you develop the relationships that you want out there. Yeah. Um, sometimes just you know just dropping from nowhere and just going yeah I want to do it. It, it just becomes more of a challenge. Yes. It, it becomes real, a real challenge. I mean, I found it challenging going to Trinidad it, with the background I had and the, the, the connections I had. It was still a challenge because it's, you know, you're still sort of viewed with a bit of skepticism, even though you've lived there, even though, but, you know, with the accent and so on and so forth, you know, you get the challenges. So, uh, but venture out there. That, that's not an excuse not to do it. Mm. It's best that you go and do it and you say, well, tried it. It went well or it didn't go well, but you learn for the next one. And that's, that, to me, is priceless. Um, yeah. So what's, the, what's next for MAD? MAD. Uh, next for MAD, we, we are uh, pushing out, a, like I said, a new, a new development type uh, for Tobago. These, uh, we call it tapia cabins. Uh, tapia cabins are like small uh, lifestyle suites that are almost like little pods that you can stay in and, and uh, experience the natural wonders of the island, that's what we call it. Um, but they, they're actually uh, they're portable, so you can actually put them in different locations. So the first cluster we're putting in a place called Plymouth, a nice little plim- uh, peninsula of, uh, of land, and that's the first phase of the development, is actually putting some of those little pods there. And then for the next one is the larger development on the actual same piece of of, of property, it's about 25 apartments um, with cinema and all these other sort of uh, good amenities. But we, we, we've we've developed the product in a way that uh, it, we, we feel it's it's uh, good commercially, but also it's not over developing to the point of where it's just a uh, horrible gargantuan um, development that's just uh, you know for people just to you know. Uh, almost like a you don't want one of those gated communities. I, I don't like the gated community concept. 
yeah. passive security laws. So we're developing, it's coming along, but that's what we're focusing on right now. The Tapia cabins are, are for me, um, they, they work really well. We actually just did an exhibition on them recently at the World Travel Market with the Tobago Tourism Agency. So we kind of launched it there. Um, we had the VR sort of headsets, uh, so people can actually go inside it. Um, but we feel it's going to be really, really, a kind of really great impact on Tobago, the tourism sector itself. Because I think the days of having large, multi-room, uh, like 100, 200 room developments in the Caribbean islands, it's particularly Tobago, I don't think that, I think that's kind of coming to an end now. People are not are as confident to do this type of development. It's more, it's more now about experiences. Small experiences, nimble type of developments where, you know, people can really get engrossed in the culture, experience, you know, the landscapes, beaches, you know, tradition, cultural traditions, mm. and then leave and, you know, feel, feel and come back and do, and do that, do it all again. So we feel the Tapia cabins really, really, really kind of fulfill that. And um, it's act, that actually, the, the cabins themselves, Tapia cabins are, are actually derived from Tapia houses, the, the housing type that I was telling you about in Trinidad. We've actually used that typology to create that, uh, that type. So, mm. so yeah, so we're, hopefully that should be going out in, uh, should be finished in August next year, 2020. Great. Yeah, 2020 buzz. Love yeah. it. <laughs> Love so it. That, that, that's our main focus at the moment. So, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Herman, thank you so much. Absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for having me. It's good speaking to you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guest do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.